we've got 18 plays, 18 plays that are published around Shakespeare's lifetime in this quarto format. What's interesting is that then in 1623, when the great first folio is published, we've all seen this sort of iconic image, Shakespeare on the left, you know, saying you know, to the reader how marvelous he is. It's published by some of the king's men um, and by the publishers, the, uh, the printers, Jaggard and Blunt in 1623, seven years after Shakespeare dies seven years after he dies. And this is regarded as it were the sort of the complete works. And you see the way in which it's divided into comedies, histories, and tragedies. Eight, uh, 17 new plays appear in the folio that we've never seen before. Never seen them before. But we've still got the 18 quarto versions that appear here as well. And they're different. They're different. So you've got plays like um, Measure for Measure, the Measure for Measure folio is different from the Measure for Measure quarto. King Lear, um, very different. Titus Andronicus, very different. Romeo and Juliet, very different. Um, so you've got this whole problem about what I call variant texts. You've got very, very different texts going on. Um, we've no idea whether Shakespeare authorized these 17 new plays. Plays, of course, like The Tempest. Tempest appears for the first time ever. We've never seen it before. If the folio hadn't have been there, we may never have seen The Tempest. We don't know. Um, it says that they're published according to the true original copies. Now, that's great, but what, what's a true original copy? Copy of what? Right? So this leads us, of course, to realize that there is no original authorial text. It's gone. It's gone in copies of copies of copies of manuscripts that have circulated in Shakespeare's playhouse, in printers' shops. They've gone around and around and around. Okay? There's no single Shakespeare text. We can't get back to what Shakespeare ever meant to say. Hooray! This is liberating. It's not a bad thing. I think it's actually a really good thing. Um, you have, indeed, three versions of Hamlet. I think this is extraordinary. The greatest play in Western literature is the most messed up, right? It's published um, in 1603 as the tragical history of Hamlet. It's 2,153 lines long. Just a year later, 18 months later, it's published again, um, newly imprinted and enlarged to almost as much again as it was. This has 3,674 lines. And then it's published again in, the, in 1623 in the folio, and this has... Um, it omits 222 lines, I've counted them, I'm sad, um, <laughs> but has five new passages of 83 lines. Okay? So this makes understanding these plays um, as single texts really, really difficult. Okay? And I'm moving towards why this is very important, because you get... Hamlet's looking like this. Okay, so these are the different versions. I'm not going to go through them, but I just, yeah, I'll leave them up so you can have a look. The most famous one, of course, is that the first quarter, I'd give the first quarter, the, this first text published in 1603, a good run for its money. It's the first edition. And in the first edition, Hamlet, in his To Be or Not To Be speech, says, uh, To Be or Not To Be, uh, aye, there's the point. I like it, it's very northern. Aye, there's the point. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, and it's, a, it's only when you get to the second quarter that you get to be or not to be, that is the question, and it's reproduced um, in folio. Now, this means that you have great liberation across these three texts. I can talk to you later about the radically different aspects. There are massive differences. The King Lear version um, gives, in one version, Edgar gets the last lines in King Lear, and in the other version, Albany does. Right? Something radical has gone on. And we don't know what. Shakespeare scholars cannot answer this question. Now, one theory is that Shakespeare is revising his plays. And I'm quite amenable to this. I like the idea that in 1603, there's a first version of Hamlet. In 1605, after they've knocked it around the stage a little bit, and they've said, Bill, it's not working. That to be or not to be speech, it needs changing. <laughs> and Bill goes, fine, okay, I'll work on it. And I need to add a bit more. If you'd written Hamlet, the greatest play in Western literature, wouldn't you want to fiddle with it a little bit? Just a little change. Just... And this is one argument that, of course, it then becomes twice as long in 1605. The folio text then nips it back a bit. 
Are you seeing a Shakespeare who is constantly revising, changing, adding, deleting, finessing, massaging the play? I think so. That seems like a really obvious idea. This is not a period where you believe that there's a romantic notion of the text and it's finished. It's completely finished. You can't mess with it. I think that's quite a good idea. So, if that's true, it's never finished. Shakespeare's plays are always in a state of endless becoming. They're always becoming something different. Shakespeare probably dies in 1616 going, oh, I really would like another crack at Hamlet. Yeah? Now, what, what the team that put the folio together have done, we don't know. Have they got the last version? We don't know. But I suspect that it's being created through performance and rehearsal. Those different texts have been shaped from a very short one to a massively long one. You can't perform that. It's about four hours the second quarter to the folio. Now, there's a problem because hopefully you're going, oh, he's talking about text too much. Well, I'm going to say, yeah, we need to kind of move on because this is the problem that we now have. This, this is actually one of the most important things that happened last year for the 400th anniversary. This was the publication of the New Oxford Shakespeare, edited by a Shakespeare scholar called Gary Taylor and the rest of his team. Very, very significant publication, which is a new complete works. But they'd embedded all the stuff I've been telling you about, variant texts and quartos and folios. When Gary Taylor first published his first version of the Oxford Complete Works back in 1986, he did it with Sir Stanley Wells. And that text, that text of the Complete Works ran to 1,400 pages. This baby <laughs> is published in three volumes with another one to come, and it's over 8,500 pages long. Now, there's too much text. Right? Nobody, they're working at the limit of what you can do with a complete works. I can hardly use this in the classroom. It's utterly, no, it's not utter, anybody from Oxford University Press here. It's, it's, it's quite difficult to work with, right? <laughs> um, it's also not only embedded the stuff about text, but it's also discovered, some of you will know, collaboration. So they're saying that uh, 17 of Shakespeare's plays are in collaboration with other writers. So he's, they're saying that Marlowe was involved in Henry VI, that Middleton was involved in plays like Measure for Measure, um, and also Macbeth. And actually, my wife, who's a Shakespearean, uh, came here to Hay last year and pointed out that Middleton actually wrote the witches in Macbeth. Shakespeare didn't write them. So that kind of puts a bit of a kibosh to that A-level question about what Shakespeare thinks about witches, because he didn't think anything, because he didn't write it. <laughs> but these are really important aspects of how you now approach uh, the plays. So I think it leaves you, and, and it's a great thing to look at. If anybody wants to look at it, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, but I think, as I say, we have too much text because we're building in these questions about the history of the text, the history of the book. We're building in the whole question about collaboration. And so where does this leave us? Where does this leave us in terms of how you might use some of these insights, especially in the classroom? Well, I think the first thing is, is to be really skeptical of the additions that you're given. So I endlessly have students who say, oh, I was doing this text at A-level, but the teacher told me that that's not the right way to interpret that line. It's not the right way to interpret that line. How are you going to interpret a modern conflated edition of Hamlet when it's got three texts stuck together? That's what you have. If you now go and buy Hamlet in a modern edition, it sticks together the first quarter, the second quarter, and the folio. As a result, you have a play text which, if you were to sit down and to perform it, would last for over six hours. That's not what Shakespeare intended, right? So the modern editions are really, really problematic. Kenneth Branagh did it in the 80s. You know, and there's this great story that Prince Charles went incognito to watch it and he wept. And one of the jokes was, yeah, I'd weep after six hours of, of <laughs> Kenneth Branagh doing Hamlet. Um, it's not the authentic Hamlet. It's not the authentic text. 